Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Wicked Podcast. Today I'm talking to Tom Scott, the founder of Verified IO and the ex-founder of Fearless. And I will talk to him about all things design types to hire and what kind of skills and value these people can bring to today's business. I hope you enjoy. Before the interview, a quick word from our very first sponsor, Sandcaster. We use Sandcaster for all our audio and video recording, and it's a very nifty tool that splits up all the channels for very easy editing. Sandcaster is used by 10% of all active podcasts. You can get 40% off the first three months and unlimited audio and video recordings with our special coupon code Wicked Podcast. I repeat, I repeat, I repeat, Wicked Podcast for 40% off. And now the interview. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wicked Podcast. Today I'm here with Tom Scott. Hello, Tom, and uh, thanks for being with me. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really good to be here. So as usual, we start at the top. So please tell our audience who you are and what you do. So yeah, so my name's Tom Scott. I am the founder of Verified, which is an invite-only design network. Um, our mission is to help companies find the best talent in the most efficient way with a focus on design execs and senior ICs. Uh, previous to that, I was the co-founder of Fearless, uh, which was a consultancy for a uh, design consultancy where we grew that design team to around 32 in the end. And then we also did talent as well. Um, and then I moved away from that in February to focus back on more exec recruitment slash talent for ICs. Wonderful. So I just had a really great uh conversation with one of our industry great stuff Paul from you know ex-IBM and uh, Expedia who has probably hired more designers than most of us all together in his life um yeah. and we talked a lot about yeah we talked a lot about you know change transformation that it often uh, needs in order to bring new designers on board to you know have design leadership convince business about the value of design and so on and, and it seems to be a bit of a it's been struggling years um, and more, most recently because the economic downturn, there's a lot of impact on the design community towards being cut and being shifted. What's your view on, on, on these things? So, you know, we, we have both and, and, and maybe, maybe there's a different slight differentiator there between experienced design, which is the designer that helps design and build these things and a more strategic designers who help sort of find out what the problem is, do research and look at actually what the business case might be for these services and products yeah. that we're building. Um, what do you see at the moment in terms of leadership and how they see the value of design and the struggles they have in, in the industries? Absolutely. So, uh, I have been speaking to a lot of design leaders over the last six months, I have anyway, but I've really ramped it up as, as we started to verify them and getting a lot of insights into uh, different industries uh, and also speaking to non-design execs on how they view design. Mm -hmm. um, the most common themes I'm seeing at the moment are um, <clears throat> as the economy has sort of taken a bit of a tumble, uh, new CEOs are coming into organizations and not really seeing how design leadership can infuse that the business strategy with design to look three, five, 10 years out and just focused on um, cutting costs. And as part of that design leadership layers seem to be um, uh, being removed. Uh, and then also uh, design teams are moving from centralized functions to more decentralized, putting them under product teams. Um, and from there you get really poor retention rates because people want to be part, designers want to feel part of, of something. And I think if they're just execution machines on in product squads they will look to leave or um you know just a, a, a poorer retention the other thing is uh you know a lot of uh execs bring in consultancies we don't need to name who they are we all know who they are they come in uh strategic insights into how they can shape design digital product and it just happens to be you know 
three to six months later, they've got whole teams of designers in there. Um, so it's a really interesting time. There's a lot of really senior chief design officers currently available, um, being let go. Uh, and it just seems to be at the moment, uh, at the, at the C-suite level, design is just being, um, diluted quite a lot to, you know, just being like there for execution and not that, that strategic input. And, you know, you speak to some people and they're like, well, are designers doing enough to sell their ROI into these organizations? What can we be doing better? So that's where I am sort of playing where, you know, creating content and, and speaking to more non-design execs, you know, C-suite boards to actually for them to uh, realize the potential of design. So yeah, it's a really, it's a really interesting time. Uh, I think the designers that are doing the best and are getting the most opportunities are ICs, senior lead ICs who can just execute work. And, you know, there's a lot of leadership currently looking or unavailable and uh, they're sorry, available and um, there's still a need for design leadership. So I'm definitely seeing more fractional CDOs, fractional leaders coming in for one to two days um, because the companies still know they need design, but they just can't, they can't see the value of full time. And I, I'm not generalizing. These are only certain companies. There's still companies that are doing this very, very well. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting time right now. So two things, because one thing you just mentioned fractional, and I'm going to get to that, uh, in a second, uh, the other one is, and again, I had now a number of conversations about it, but more with designers than non-designers. And you said you talked to some non -de non-designers and non-design leaders, and you will do more so, which is very exciting. So I definitely kind of keep an eye on your podcast. That's for sure. Um, but the, the. Yeah. What do the non-design leaders then say where the real value is? Because I might, I might guess some of the answers, but why is, for example, things like technology still so much more valued in terms of investment than, let's say, design? Even so, ever since the 90s or since the iPhone and whatnot, we know that design, when done well and committed well into a company, is you know increasing revenue increasing margins it, it, there's study being done that the design-led company performs better on the stock market just value after value after value really hard numbers that shows the value of design that are in the public sphere that we would think people see that what what do the non hmm design leaders what are they missing or what's their argument or what do they or do they say something internal like Oh, it's not yeah. design, but I'd rather focus on that because I think that's what really makes my company. Is there anything that sort of mm. challenges design or what's the key piece you think that there's missing that they don't see? Yeah. So uh, just to take sort of a 30,000 view feet, like the, mm. you know, uh, like the view on this, um, I think it's, it comes down to the people in power as such, the people in the, these these higher end positions in companies where they normally get brought in from an exec board committee. Uh, often there's people who they know, they're not coming from a design background. So they just hire people in who they know and who they trust, which is you know, fair enough. But often they're not coming in from a design background. Often it's a, uh, you know, chief digital officers are coming in from more of a tech background, business background, finance background. And so they don't, they've not really, they, they, they understand design, but they're not designers. So they can't really like, uh, you know, handle the full breadth of it. But, but essentially I think, uh, two, sorry, just gonna, you can edit this out, but two, two, two examples. Um, I spoke to a CEO of a automotive brand and I spoke to the CEO of a like streaming TV streaming brand. And, uh, I, I spoke to them about how they ship products, services and, and build and bring to market the automotive brand was more, uh, they were focused on engineering. They were focused on, it's still like delightful experiences and uh, but more engineering focused to get something to market. Whereas the, uh, the streaming brand was all about conversions, conversion, 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 then we'll deal with the, the customers later. Um, they understand they need design, but they don't use the word design. So, uh, I had a thought, well, and this is simple. Every, every good designer will know this. Like it, 
it is what it is. But there's still a lot of designers out there who then don't speak the language of business stakeholders. And so they know they need design, but they don't, they don't care about wireframes. They don't care about service blueprints. They just care about results for the business. And so I think more designers actually could probably do with speaking business terminology, speaking that business language and have design as the tool in their arsenal, not necessarily, I'm a designer, I do this, but actually talk about what the, um, the business stakeholder cares about. And it just happens to be you're a designer and that's how you get to the result. So I think it's more changing the way we speak to these people to get that buy-in, prove that value over time, rather than I've got to come in, do it this way. Because I think a lot of non-design uh, you know, leaders and people that I've worked with and, and, and hired for often get burnt by, especially contractors, design contractors who come in and say, right, we need, no, we need to do it this way. This is the process. This is what we need to do for service design all this. And it, and they believe it just slows down the whole, the whole process of shipping a product or service. And they need to be more iterative and, more, and, and, and faster. And I think that just comes down to um, not being able to speak the, the, the business language terminology. But, uh, you know, I'm general, generalizing this. From no, no, absolutely. Project, but I think but that's just a few things. Yeah. That what, 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 you, but what, you just, what you just pointed out, like, yeah, process. I've been, I've seen a lot where processes where you had to attune the processes to the company, not just say, this is the process, take it or leave it. But the other thing, when you talk about doing things faster, it's really interesting because we all want to do things faster, but the problem is that just doing things faster doesn't need to get, doesn't get you to results quicker, right? It's actually doing smarter, right? Um, Yes. So the, 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 the story I'm trying to tell is that, look, there's a hundred, there's a hundred ideas here and one of them will make you money, right? Finding but you will not, you will not be able to identify which of those hundred ideas this is because nobody knows these things. It's so complex, right? And someone from Amazon saying that it's like, look, this is how we work. We look at a hundred ideas and we try to as quick as possible test and de-risk them that we know which one to build and more likely make money with it. You can't build a hundred. Uh, you, you can't possibly be fast enough no, to do that no. and you're not going to have the money to do that either right but then therefore if you don't blindly go and jump for the first idea the risk is crazy right so the, the thing mm. i often don't understand is that companies still think they can just jump at the first thing in front of them without having tested and proven assumptions to and will go straight into it because what i've seen therefore and what mckinsey supports with data is when you do that, your stuff will fail more often than not. That means you lose money more often than not. That means you're not competitive. Mm -hmm. The thing I don't get when I'm literally thinking about investment yeah. in business then is why is that not a business principle that you actually test fast and cheaply and then build what matters. But the testing fast and cheaply is, it's not just thinking, it's actually doing things. And it's, it's amazing that that seemingly hasn't gotten through to designers that that is actually de-risking investment essentially which should everyone should love so it's interesting that that narrative is not there mm. but the other thing i want to then go into in particular when we talk about learning mm. what the actual narrative the actual value really is we need to invest in relationships and we need to build this over time because you can't just tell someone one day and then they buy in and everything's happy then that obviously hasn't happened and uh, hasn't worked in the past. So my question is then, if you then look at these fractional engagements now that seem to be coming a bit of a thing where someone comes in for a few days, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, that sounds like, you know, I'm hiring a girlfriend experience and not investing fully into a relationship, which means what value can that possibly bring? There will be big pieces missing and you will not be able to gain the value of it because when you grow things in a company or anywhere, you need to invest and take care of it every day. This is, this is, is a full-time job. Yeah. It's not like a two days a week thing. Do, do, why do you, I can imagine it's popular yeah. because of cost, but why do you think don't do, do leaders then see the downside of that saying, oh, we're just doing that a little bit. So we don't expect an actual return of investment too much because we know we're not really fully mm -hmm. buying it anyways. What's, 
do they do they see any of that? Is that sort of mm. part of the conversation of the are they realizing that? I think uh, just going back to the point, just briefly on the the, the testing quick as as well, quick and fast. I think mm. a, a lot of um, people panic because, like, especially in you know economic downturn, I think people need to show the value to their shareholders very quickly. And I think if they see this like real like upfront cost and design, there's no guarantee it's going to work. It's like they just go on their intuition and gut most of the time. Um, so I'm seeing that seeing that a lot. But, but anyway, yeah. So going back to the uh, the fractional point, I think the where I've seen it work really successfully is where they where the companies maybe got ahead of design, who's more focused on the product and making sure that product is like you know the craft is incredible. And then they bring in like a, a VP and you know, chief design officer type person to then figure out the more of the, the why and like the future thinking for design and infusing that with the business strategies like further out. So, but if you then have someone that's just coming in for two days to work on not only the product, then educating shareholders, stakeholders on the importance of design, then I see it fading. Because I think I think it's it's very hard to do both at the same time for two days a week. It's, it's it's almost impossible, and I think it's more of a you're just there to churn out some stuff. And I think people won't necessarily take you as seriously in in some cases mm-hmm. because you're literally there one to two days a week, and there's not really much true impact I think you can have. I think to be a really successful like fractional CDO, you need someone that's focused on the craft as well, and then you focus more on the educating the company, connecting the dots with design rather than just designing the, the product. Um, but to be honest, I've not seen the fractional part work that well recently. Uh, there's only a few occasions. And like I said, just then, uh, because I think people, uh, they expect too much in two days a week, way too much. You know, design isn't a magic bullet. It takes time to get it, to get it, to get it done well. Um, I had a great example with uh, a very a large company um, last year. They brought in a head of design for three days a week. They expected the world. Uh, after three months, they were super frustrated that they'd not that the deliverables were uh, not as what they expected. It was poor. They hadn't got the they hadn't integrated design properly. Well, you know what do you expect three days a week for three months into a company that's a hundred thousand plus people. And so there's this expectation on on designing to come in and like fix the company or like fix the, yeah, fix the world straight away. And it, it takes time. It's, you know, I mean, I'm really CDOs, right? Yeah, these top, yeah. top CDOs, they're not there for, two, they're there for 10 plus years. Yeah. Like Mauro yeah, Puccini, time, right? So, yeah. How long has he been at Pepsi? Mm-hmm. You know, 10, I think he's been there nearly 10 years. Yeah, he's not going to go in for two years and make, you know, crazy change straight away. And, and, and I think I, I read an article about Indra Noy uh, bought, Brought Mara in, and uh, you know he's invested in Mara for the long term, and and now you see the, you know the payoff. Like it's it's a very famous case study for design uh, at PepsiCo. So do you think it's a difference between because um, because I'm wondering two things. One is that you know, uh, and I don't know how, how many of those types you've talked to yet, but I'm sure you probably have a few of those on your list. You know. Is the expectation to technology the same? Because if I look at any of the transformation projects I've been working in, they have two-year plans. Um, they can deploy a single piece of tech within six yeah. months, and even then they have to tune it, right? So there doesn't seem to be an expectation yeah. on technology to mm. to drop in three months and then get return of investment, yet they expect it from design. That feels, I can say, unfair or just like generally not understanding yeah. how these things work and why do you give other things that probably actually less contribute to value mm. often are more on cost cutting, whereas yeah. design can look into innovation on top of it, um, which always has a higher margin, higher value contribution, mm-hmm. you know, but they expect, they expect that they, they give, they give technology a longer term to come to fruition yet in design, they go, yeah, you got three months and yeah. after that, we get very impatient very quickly. Uh, did you get it? I mean, Please yeah. put that as a question to one of the people we talk to, because I want to hear the oh, answer to that. Yeah. Um, do you think it's because, like, with technology and engineering, like, you, 
it's it's more tangible. So like you, you know, you uh, you ship a product from engineering. It's you you just have like these deliverables, these milestones. It's very clear to see, and you can see when some something's been shipped. Whereas in design, do you, and it may be a question back to you actually. Yeah, it's, it's harder <laughs> to see that ROI after like three to six months because good design takes time, right? So. And I think this goes back to a point I made in my, a LinkedIn post, um, I think it was about a month ago now. I said, you know, a lot of design leaders and a lot of designers don't know what they could be fired for. So an engineering and product people do mainly because you know, it's very clear what they've got to do. They've got to increase conversion by a certain percentage based on this, or they've got to ship this by this date. And so it's easier to show the ROI. Whereas design say you're doing a, a discovery phase for three months after that what's what have you actually done that's valuable to the company yeah you've figured out what I know. what you've got to do and then you've actually got to go and implement it but that upfront cost can be quite a lot for a discovery phase and then you know business has changed very rapidly so that might be redundant so that's that's what i'm thinking is like you know how can designers and this is what i'm exploring and i don't know the answer to this but like how can you const like say you find a, a senior stakeholder sponsor for design, you know, CEO, CTO, whatever. How can you keep them engaged constantly to say, look, this is the ROI, this is what we're doing, this is what you can expect, and keep them on board? Uh, and I think you you interviewed uh, you interviewed Doug Powell, um, and he um, mentioned a while ago, like uh, when Phil Gilbert went in there and. I think it was the old CEO, like the very senior sponsor. That case study is super interesting how they managed to get that buy-in for 3,000 plus designers, but then keep that clear and the ROI of why we're doing this constantly because they could have backed out on that after like 1,000. Like, no, this is bloody expensive. But they, yeah. th that case study is in incredible. So essentially, the, 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 the short answer to that is, uh, how can designers keep constantly proving their ROI and keep that stakeholder yeah. engaged to keep getting that buy-in? Because like I said before, a C-suite change can can be really detrimental to design because it can yeah. just really dilute it if you, if they're not bought into it. And, and I'm seeing so many you know CEOs come in and I won't name companies obviously, but there's like three yeah. large companies that I've worked with. They've all had CEO changes. 50% of the design team's gone straight away. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and I think I, and, and that's on, that has to be on. Yeah, no, it's, it's it absolutely true. So, and, community to and I, and I like, I like, and I like the way you're flipping this on me. So I think we already know what we're going to talk about at your podcast. Cause I think that's one of those things where, you know, I have a lot to say about, cause I know I have enough tech background that I know how these things work, how you deploy stuff and so on. Right. Sure. So, and yes, so in parts just to, to work this down. So in parts, yes, it's absolutely true. Um, when you buy a piece of kit, you know exactly what it costs. You know what it costs per person. Therefore, you have a rough uh, understanding of benefits per person, right? When you say, okay, I'm going to buy 200 licenses for Miro. So going out there and now people are feeding back to me, hey, we're now enjoying so much more working collaboratively on this board and you're saving a lot of time and there's more transparency and it makes the whole conversation better. You know, that's an immediate improvement you mm -hmm. get. As, 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 as feedback from people and productivity looks better and probably is better as well. Um, sometimes with something as simple as that, you can easily get a quick feedback and a quick fix. Um, but even there, the maturity then can totally evolve because, yeah. you know, Miro is a complex tool. People will learn it differently. You can do so many different things with it. If you just do the basic stuff, you will only get ever so much. If you want to dive deeper into it, just like you do. And it's absolutely true if you yeah. have a bunch of designers sitting there and you go after a while, so what have you done? Because it's still then engineers often building it. So the engineers are mm. doing the work and the designers sitting there doing the yeah. thinking. It's obviously not true when you think yeah. about that. Yeah. But, um, and I've, I've been proven in some projects where the design activities and the research itself saved millions to a company or discovered Mm. large mitigation risks in companies where pe people could have gotten sued left, right, and yep. front for a staggering amount of money, losing customers. Mm -hmm. And it was design research activists who found that hole and helped fix it. Um, so, 
yes, the value is not immediate. It's a bit more trickier to do. And, and to be honest, talking to people like enterprise architects, they're having the same challenge there because they're sitting in a very strategic space just as well, just like designers. They're often fighting as well for recognition. Yeah. And, so, and people ask them, what's your value? So you, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you analyze the whole ecosystem, you draw up a lot of diagrams. Now you're telling me how to structure my tech. What's the benefit of that? Where's it saving money? And there is yeah. money to be saved. There's a reason why this exists. And if, if you give people time to look at the business case, you can go and you find actually a lot of good money with these practices. And in turn, I would yeah. say, and we can talk more about your podcast, I've seen a lot of tech buys and deployments where you look at the business case and the claims of what they're saving, and they're not really solid. I look at it yeah. and go, how did that get signed off? Because if you really look at it, the reality disagrees with that benefit completely. That business case doesn't hold any water, right? Um, yeah. So I've seen a lot of those on terms, but it seems if it's tech, the least you can claim, well, I bought a pile of stuff and now everyone has a pile of stuff. Isn't that great? We've achieved something, even so the actual achievement might not be there. So there's that. Yeah. And I think in terms of yeah. longer term as well, there is really, a, a, there is definitely a risk for designers on that with the CEO change. And I just talked to, as you know, to a mutual friend, you really introduced me to, you know, um, that person telling me, look, she's been there in the mm -hmm. company for a while now. She wants to leave because the new CEO restructured. We're not, we're not just executing robots as designers. And she, that, that yeah. devastates her job and any of her yeah. smart thinking that she has and the company doesn't recognize it. And so she's planning to move, right? So it's pretty, pretty uh, clear that that is, is, is a challenge for a long term um, buildup of design and maintaining it. But it's usually you, 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 you prove something on a small scale and then you keep evolving it. IBM's done also a great study with Forrester proving how much return of investment you're getting. It's amazing. Lots of hard numbers study that everyone should know, but few people do it yeah. oddly enough. But so, so it's there and I think it's, it's really interesting to talk about that. And I'd love to talk more about, you know, that in the future, because, you know, my last episode, this episode, mm -hmm. and I think I have two other following, they're all around the same area. And I hope that, that we can contribute a little bit to helping yeah. clients understand a bit more of that. Um, but therefore I have always more questions than I have time. So I'm just trying to think, yeah, so as a last question, and you have to probably compress that a little bit, because I saw you've done some amazing posts over at LinkedIn, asking some really, really, really good, clear questions to the design community, and you got a lot of really good feedback. Um, if you just as a last sort of view, then could wrap up some of sort of the biggest, either the best two insights you saw there or the best things people pointed out or things people most struggling with some of it. What were sort of the highlights mm. of that? What you, what you got from that and the responses? Because it seems to be very yeah. active. Everyone wants to contribute. Everyone wants to say something yeah. towards it. So you, you're picking really good stuff there, it seems. Uh, so you're so, so seemingly, yeah, yeah you, no, you found um, something. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it, it's super interesting. I think um, the biggest, like, I would say the two main things to touch upon there is one is obviously the uh um integration of design and i think uh, a lot of successful design leaders have successfully integrated design at like the top level and like have dotted lines and ceos to make that real impactful change a lot of uh you know vps of design svps of design you know reporting into like cmos or cpo ctos and they're still probably five to six layers away from like the top um you know uh board members or ceos and it's and it's hard for them to get that that true buy-in to make impactful change you know they they're doing work on you know the products the services but they're not being able to work on you know bigger design strategy pieces and how design can influence the the business strategy and one CDO actually mentioned this and he said like, well, you know, everyone wants a seat at the table, but then when they get that seat at the table, they don't know what to do with it. So it's really, it's really um, important to, uh, to learn the business and start proving that value slowly over time um, and being able to uh, change the way you're speaking about design to certain stakeholders to make them 
to, f- to give them that peace of mind that you're going to make them look good. Because obviously, it, they, I think a, a lot of like, if, if you're going to get a senior sponsor, and they're going to risk, uh, you know, their budgets or whatever, you they need to be assured that you're going to make them look good, ultimately, um, to get their bonuses or, or, or whatever it is. So um, being able to change the way you, you talk about design to certain people is, is it seems to be a big one. Um, the other one is obviously this fractional um, uh, thing, uh, like a, a lot of design leaders are just getting a really fed up in their roles. And I actually speak to a lot and a lot of uh, leaders and I, I always ask them, like, are you even happy in your role? <laughs> Often they're not because they're, they're either dealing with politics, they're being pushed back constantly, they're not being able to deliver what they know they can deliver. So they look to move elsewhere. And I think this fractional leadership uh, engagements are really interesting to them because you know they can diversify their portfolio of clients, make the same money. Um, but then is it actually going to help that business? Who knows? Mm-hmm. So there's there's a lot of unhappy design leaders out there at more at like VP level, um, uh, less so on like the CDO level because the true CDOs have the buy-in and you know doing really big big work and they're there for five to ten years. I don't know many true CDOs who are one to two year type of projects. It's just very rare. Um, so I'd say that, and then obviously uh, I'm speaking to a lot more design, non-design executives right now, and like, I'm creating content with you know CEOs, CIOs, uh, CMOs on what they see about and, and what, what they see a good design practice to be and what they look for in design leadership. And maybe this is for another podcast, but the, the biggest uh, insight I've had for, from from that is the needs of design leadership is changing at certain organisations. You know, because of the pandemic, because of AI. You know, the the services are changing, the products are changing, so they need different types of of design leadership. But I think the key one, key principle for design leadership is always integration of design, ensuring that we can really integrate this into the whole business. And I think that is the challenge and the million dollar question that we're all working towards by creating this kind of content, creating more awareness and fighting that good fight. Great words to wrap this up. Wonderful conversation and <laughs> probably the first time someone flipped the conversation nice. on me, which is brilliant. So uh, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, feel free like yeah. to either see you yeah. at your podcast or you catch up in a couple of months time when you have maybe more insights on the on yes. the new narrative of where to go with stuff. Super exciting things there. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Thanks so much. You've been listening to The Wicked Podcast with co-hosts Marcus Kirsch and me, Troy Norcross. Please subscribe on Podomatic, iTunes, or Spotify. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. Please tell us your thoughts in the comment section and let us know about any books for future episodes. You can also get in touch with us directly on Twitter on at Wicked and Beyond or at Troy underscore Norcross. Also learn more about the Wicked Company book and the Wicked Company project at wickedcompany.com.